Hello, everybody. Uh, today is Thursday, March 1st, and we are bringing you episode two of ZK Snacks, where uh, me and Janine are going to break down ASIC Boost for uh, everybody out there. So I guess, uh, first off, in order to understand ASIC Boost, uh, you need to have a grasp on the block header structure. So I guess uh, you want to take it away there, Janine? Yeah, definitely in order to understand what ASIC Boost is and why why it affects Bitcoin so much, you have to know uh, like the structure of blocks, um, especially the block header. And so you prob- most of you probably already know that a block in Bitcoin is, and a lot of other blockchains, is a group of transactions that have been validated by nodes in the network, especially mining nodes, um, according to the consensus rules of the network. And in order for a block to be appended onto the Bitcoin blockchain, a miner has to solve a puzzle, which is finding partial hash collisions in what is known as uh, the candidate blocks nonce. And the first miner to do this uh, uh, provides it, provides, provides the network um, with a proof of work, and then they are rewarded with a new Bitcoin. Every block has a block header, which includes the version number, the hash of the previous block, the Merkle root, i.e. the hash of the root of the Merkle tree, including uh, this block's transactions, the creation timestamp in seconds from Unix Epoch, and the difficulty target, which is uh, how hard it is to find the hash, which can vary over time, and also the nonce, which is a random number. Regarding covert ASIC boost, which nobody will get into later, it's important to understand that there are two areas of the Mocha root, uh, the first 28 bytes, which is affected, and the last four bytes, which is not affected. When the block header is hashed twice, uh, this produces what we call a block hash, which uniquely identifies that block. A block hash is not really stored in the blockchain, but rather is a metadata point that is computed by every node participating in the network when they verify and store the blockchain. When uh, the segregated witness uh, soft fork came into the network in August 2017, it didn't really sh- change the structure of blocks as much as some people think, but the small change that it did make had a big impact in terms of capacity increases. In simple terms, what SegWit did is it moved the witness data, i.e. the unlocking script, uh, into its own Merkle tree. Previously, the witness data was embedded in a transaction's inputs, but in a SegWit transaction, the witness data is Um, in its own witness data structure accompanying the transaction. And this reduced the complexity of signature verification. Uh, If you want to go more in depth on the structure of blocks and SegWit, um, recommended reading is chapters seven and nine of Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, Shinobi, do you want to explain uh, what ASIC boost is, the difference between overt and covert ASIC boost and how SegWit affected those? Mm Mm-hmm. So to first start off, here's a, a little visualization of actually how the, the Merkle root connects to all the individual transactions in a block. And pretty much what happens is each uh, transaction is organized linearly, and then each of them is individually hashed. And then from that point, each two hashes are compounded into another hash and so on and so forth until you have the single Merkle root hash that's included in the header committing to all the transactions. And as a quick side note, in the instance that there is an odd number of transactions in the block, they will simply duplicate the last transaction to even out the numbers so that it will lead to a balanced Merkle tree. And as Janine just said, um, when you're hashing the actual block header in SHA-256, it's broken into two chunks, which leaves the 28 bytes of the Merkle root in the first chunk and four in the second. And pretty much uh, what Covert ASIC Boost does is it allows you to kind of save a little bit of work by having the second chunk pre-computed and then searching for collisions with the first chunk that have the same uh, last four bytes in the Merkle root um, that's already in the pre-computed second half. And so pretty much there's really two ways that you can do this. Um, The first way is effectively kind of shuffling the right branch of the Merkle tree. And the thing about this, um, in the graphical example, this is only a, uh, a tree with a depth of three. But this would be workable with uh, deeper Merkle roots because of the way the hash commitments work. And what you would do is go down two branches from the Merkle root, and you would flip 
both of those hashes. And because of the way the tree works, those hashes are the commitments to all transactions below it and simply flipping those two hashes and generating the new hash and then a new Merkle root only takes two extra hashes. And in this way, you can kind of save a little work in changing the Merkle root and looking for collisions. And you can kind of go a little deeper with this. Um, like, let's say you don't find a collision with the first hash switch. You can move to the right again and continue going down only having to recompute that side of the Merkle tree on the edge until eventually you're flipping transactions around. But the deeper into the tree you go, the less efficient it is, which kind of leads into the second way you can do this, which is part of the reason that a lot of people suspect miners have been doing this for a while, is there's actually a second nonce in the Coinbase transaction so that after you've run through um, the entire nonce range in the header itself, you can increment the Coinbase nonce once and then go through an entire range of the, the header nonce again and not have to recompute the, the Merkle root so often. And when you're doing this with an empty or almost empty block, you can effectively invert the relationship between the nonces there where the one in the header is kind of acting as the one you flipped periodically and you're grinding the Coinbase notes more frequently to look for uh, collisions with the last four bytes of the Merkle root. And this obviously has a lot of negative impacts on the network because it's pretty much incentivizing practically empty blocks, which uh, is, is no good for everybody and leads to a lot more fee pressure. And this is pretty much contrasted with overt ASIC boost. Um, like Janine said in the beginning, the first field in the block header is the version number, which is historically been used to increment new block versions with slight changes in uh, consensus rules about what's allowed in the block, but was also recently repurposed uh, for BIP9 to deploy multiple soft forks in, um, at the same time. And because soft forks really only need one bit, like one actual number in binary in the version field, and there are 32 bits here, a lot of these can just be changed in the way that you would be shuffling the Merkle tree or changing the Coinbase, no or Coinbase notes without requiring actually recomputing the entire Merkle tree of transactions. And so in this way, you can still look for collisions in the Merkle root but without any of the, the negative incentives with covert ASIC boost to mine empty or practically empty blocks. And so as Janine's about to get into with overt ASIC boost, really there's no negative incentives. And the only problem is obviously ASIC boost is patented. And so this could be used to as a, a dis in a, or I'm sorry, a specific advantage for a miner holding the patent where other miners wouldn't be able to because the version bits being flipped is very obvious when you look at a block header. And as a final note, with the addition of the witness commitment in the Coinbase transaction for SegWit, um, this would require the witness tree to be changed, mirroring any changes in the main uh, transaction Merkle tree, which pretty much destroys any efficiency in Merkle grinding for covert ASIC boost. Right. So um, today on March 1st, uh, you may have seen an announcement from Little Dragon Technology LLC, which is a very young California-based company that was only formed in last year or so. And they're placing ASIC Boost under a defensive licensing scheme known as the Blockchain Defensive Patent License. Usually patents are offensive tools of the patent holder for the purpose of preventing competition, generating revenue either from the creation of a monopoly on the sale of a product uh, which allows them to collect royalties for people who also want to participate in that, um, or by suing other parties, individuals, or companies who are found to have infringed on their patent rights. Uh, and you may have even heard of the term patent troll, which is an entity that acquires patents and acts aggressively in the legal sense against infringers in a way that is beyond the norm or the scope of the value that they actually contributed. 
A defensive patent, on the other hand, is used to protect a patent holder from infringement lawsuits by keeping the patent out of the hands of individuals or companies who would use them offensively, uh, especially, as I just mentioned, patent trolls. Companies can even aggregate or pool their financial resources together in order to purchase the patents and also defend themselves as a group. Um, On the same day that the ASIC Boost defensive patent was announced, uh, BitMix Research also published a blog post on the effects of patents and the incentives produced by either covert or or overt ASIC Boost. They had very similar sentiments on the issue, Um, essentially um, giving... uh, Essentially, if ASIC Boost was placed under an offensive patent instead of a defensive one, it could potentially give one mining company an insurmountable advantage over the competition, resulting in a gap that could not be closed due to legal restrictions. And this could undermine Bitcoin's core value proposition, uh, which is decentralization. And it is possible, um, as they say, that the Bitcoin community could... Um, conduct a soft fork to block ASIC boost if the patent problem becomes significant. Instead, what they want to do is place it under under a defensive patent, which will protect, uh, quote, protect decentralization in Bitcoin, um, where you basically have companies like uh, Little like Little Dragon Technology LLC that get other companies together. Um, and this is uh, defensive patents have been done before. That's why the term uh blockchain uh, defensive license was or patent license was developed because um, it was a way to not uh, rely on the violence of the state to uh, um, basically protect this technology. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully uh, with a little breakdown on the technical and the legal side, um, everybody here can see that as long as the patent isn't being held uh, and used defensively by a monopoly, unlike covert ASIC boost, which creates the negative incentives to mine practically empty blocks, overt ASIC boost doesn't really come with any negative incentives for the network as long as it's something open that everybody producing ASICs in the ecosystem can use. And hopefully uh, this helped educate uh, everybody a little bit on this topic. And um, I guess we'll see you next time.